Hi everyone, welcome to Filmmakers and their Films. Today we'll be talking about story, plot, and meaning. And with us we have Gagwendra sir, who is a well-known film critic and author. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mohammed. Okay, now, now by and large, the meaning in any film, okay, is contained in the narration, right? I'm talking only about fiction film. It's contained in the narration, okay? So the narration is the key thing. It would include milieu, context, characterization, relationships, all this uh, stuff is what the narration would include, okay? If meaning is brought in through elements like visual style, music, performance, in addition to the narration, when I say performance, I mean the performance working against the character. I mean, the, the, uh, I mean, if you if you have a character represented in a certain way, if the if the shall we say if the performance adds something to that character which is not written into that character, right? It would be a certain performance element which is uh, extraneous to the uh, narration in some way. It's possible. I can't really think of uh, examples right now, but it's possible. But the point is visual again, visual, uh, what uh, visual uh, style and all that, what you're showing in a movie could contradict in some way, could add something or could take away something from the actual narration as is going on. I can't once again come, come up with ideas here. Can you think of anything in where, the, where the, sorry? For love. And then uh, we have Black Swan also where there's... I haven't seen, oh, in the mood for love I've seen. What In what way would it, uh, would it take away or add to the narration? Can you think uh, of anything? Uh, so it's basically, uh, you know, the restaurant scene, like that overtonal montage kind of a thing. Where possible, yeah. If it, I, it, it's possible. I, I can't remember the film that, clo that closely. Yeah. It's a long time since I saw it. But the point is, it's, it's the basic narration is a certain thing. The film could do all kinds of things, uh, which, are, which is contrary to the basic narration. Okay, but the point is that will not alter the basic thing. The basic meaning of the film rests in the narration. Okay, now, okay, now there are two elements in narration. One is story, and the other is plot. What is story? Anybody has an idea? What's the difference between story and plot? Story is the chronological arrangement of events in the narration, right? So the question is, whatever, whatever narrative, whatever event came first would be the first element in the story chronologically. And whatever uh, event happens last would be the, the last event in the story, okay? But this is not the way films are actually, or even stories are naturally told, actually told, because what, what happens is that the telling is in the shape of the plot. Now, if you take the, for example, let us take a, a detective story. Let's take a Sherlock Holmes story. I've already done this in one of the earlier classes. If you take a Sherlock Holmes story, what is the, let us take the speckled band, right? What is the first element in the speckled band? The first element in this story in the speckled band is that this woman, is uh, mother is married to some uh, doctor who has come back from India and then something, the mother, sister and she are there. They're slightly frightened because the doctor seems a somewhat terrifying figure. And then um, the sister is killed by mysteriously on the eve of her marriage when she's likely to, when she gets married, all the property will, the father, the husband, the doctor will lose the property. So there is some possibility of foul play. And then the second uh, is also engaged and she starts hearing certain things, certain events happen. So when this, she gets frightened, she goes to Sherlock Holmes and Sherlock Holmes finds out the whole thing and discovers what has happened. This is the story, right? This is the chronological arrangement of, now of the events in the narration. But when you want to make it a plot, it would begin with Sherlock Holmes is sitting in uh, 221B Baker Street. Mrs. Hudson comes in and says, oh, and so is a lady, young lady to see you, sir. So what happens in the thing is the whole story is encapsulated in the last bit when the explanation comes, right? The detective calls all the people involved or whatever and gives the explanation for the whole thing. Usually happens in the Agatha Christie thing where Hercule Poirot, Hercule Poirot is, uh, calls all the people and say, oh, so this could have happened, that could have happened, none of it happened, this is the reason and gives you the whole thing. So that's the story. Okay, now, what you can do, what, what happens is, okay, that you can write, if, supposing you were to write a detective story, uh, who done it, how would you do it? How would you write a whodunit? Anybody has any idea? How, how to write a whodunit? Say a Sherlock Holmes kind of story. You're writing a story on your own. How would you go about it? 
start from the mystery like now where, how will you start like you know if there's uh, something to be found or you know some mystery to be unveiled in other like, words you will begin by writing the plot you're saying right no that would not be the way what would happen would be that you would write the story okay okay let us assume i am jealous of somebody who's my neighbor who's made a lot of money i haven't made money i'm running out of money this person has a lot of money is careless with his money therefore i think of various ways in which to get rid of this person so that i can make the keep that get that money for myself okay you think of the story and then you conceal that story in the plot you get me okay so the question is that when you conceal it in the plot finally there'll be something which i've forgotten something which has happened okay so then uh, when the when that uh, concealment takes in place that let's those will become clues you get me okay so the question is when the thing is un unraveled before you unravel the mystery that the story which constitutes the mystery must first be written right so if you are writing a who done it you will not begin by detective sitting in his room you will begin with a diagram and you will write this is the base basic story how are you going to conceal it right what would this lead to what clue would this yield what clue would that yield okay like silver blaze shall come so this would be the way so in other words you can take a melodrama or a tragedy something like othello okay and conceal parts of it in a certain way so that the, the, the killings in othello the story of othello is revealed as a kind of detective story it's possible you can assume that othello is just killed as demona nobody knows why what is the reason some detective from uh, pinkertons or from uh, the scotland yard comes along and he looks looks at othello's body looks at this looks at this why did this happen and investigates talks to various people and pieces together the whole thing right that's possible in the same way you can take take a detective story and unpack it in some way and come across the basic story or the melodrama and the heart of it okay i hope i've made myself clear but the basic thing is the plot is basically the way you give emphasis to the story depending on you what you want so you can if you can uh, manipulate the plot okay you manipulate the plot in order to get emotional effects that you want which would be very different from the story itself may not yield that so this is the way now is any questions up to here any have i made made myself clear up to here from now on i'll just look at the movies that's all i won't say anything how these movies get their results what is the thing why is citizen kane vertigo pulp fiction celine and julia why are they important films what is it they do what exactly is the story okay they're all they're all very intricately plotted films okay anybody has any any questions up to here i'll be happy to take them okay all right then we'll go to citizen kane right now to going to uh, going to citizen kane what is the story of citizen kane what is the formula it follows okay what is the formula it follows the formula it follows is basic thing you know in our thing is initial condition look let's say the formula in all hollywood movies initial condition okay initial condition being disturbed the protagonist struggles with the disturbance okay could result in a victory for him or a defeat for him this is the basic thing in uh, citizen kane what is the initial condition uh the Ch boy charles foster kane's unhappy uh, childhood interrupted when his mother comes into wealth right after that the mother believes that uh, whatever wealth she is coming to will not be good for the boy the boy has to be sent away away from her she and her husband are not good enough for charles foster kane he has to be given the best education somewhere in switzerland in europe and all that and brought up by a trust brought up by somebody else so that he gets the best of education and becomes the great man right what ambition she has for him is that he should become a great man this is the thing right so the question is if you look at the story uh the question is what is disturbed is the initial state of unhappiness in the initial state of happiness okay then the question is the whole film is a kind of struggle which charles foster kane not knowing what he wants in the sense he wants power he wants influence he wants women the uh, women of his life he tries to court by politics he tries to get political power everything is a failure because he wants nothing at the end of it what does he got he's got nothing actually when he and he dies alone everybody has left him he's got wealth he's got this he's lived lived a life everything he ever wanted but basically what he wanted was his childhood which was which was robbed from him what is taken away from him right when you say rosebud at the end i mean i'm not telling you anything new when you say rosebud at the end 
okay that rosebud is that sledge or whatever in which this man was boy was playing when he was a boy so finally when he's dying the last thing he dies before he thinks is the rosebud which is the name of the is this the name of the uh, the 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 toy or whatever he was playing with okay now the question is if you look at all this you look at all the wit it's a very very brilliantly written screenplay in terms of its wit its dialogue its its, its sparkles and sizzles okay but you can't it, it's the basic thing is it's trite it's not a great story right it's it's a fairly commonplace story in the sense of a rich man not getting happiness uh, struggling with happiness and finally being left unhappy this goes along with i don't know if you've heard this poem the king was uh, sick his cheek was red his eyes were clear and bright i don't know if you've heard this when you were children you were reading this kind of thing that rich people are unhappy they don't know what they want this is a kind of basically trite thing okay how does the film become such a brilliant film is entirely through the plotting okay so let us look at the way like a, let's look at the way that uh, this uh, citizen kane deals with the this restless spirit how does it how does it work okay now the, how the film deals is by hiding the story in the plot it hides the story in the plot what exactly there are several different different accounts told from different angles citizen can okay the first uh, angle is the public view the public view of citizen can uh, where, where where he seen from the news reel kind of thing the charles first can died on such a, a sensationalist talked about his thing his uh, various aspects of his life okay the various things okay no before the, before this happens there is that thing there is that uh, mysterious mansion you have of charles first can zanadu okay mysterious mansion there's a big board there there are there are zoos there is this there is that and there's this board saying no trespassing very forbidding kind of board there forbidding gates and all that and when you say no trespassing finally the whole uh, film is a kind of trespass of what charles charles first can was okay this is the way it works so then after this uh, public view of charles first can uh, takes place what happens is then you have one by one by one uh, the various stories they do not they do not what is the first uh, first uh, story told after this i think i uh, think it's by bernstein sir bernstein is it is it bernstein yeah yeah, yeah probably yeah probably after that later. yeah this is a childhood story or uh, and i think with the other guy right uh, thatcher 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 i think it's thatcher thatcher memorial thing burns then one by one you get these stories no important thing is what makes the film work is the fact that they're all separate stories right okay let me ask you a question what is the difference between rashomon which also is a, a plotted thing and and citizen kane can anybody tell me what is the difference between rashomon and citizen kane in the way the plots are used what is it so, so what i think is rashomon is basically the fact is the same but people look at it as to how it happened to them it's basically their truth what they are telling it's their vision i think you know I, the way i see it is rashomon the facts are disputed right different come people come up with different stories okay each one is telling his own story in order to justify his own thing to make a make himself look good this is basically it so there's not one story there there are actually four or five how many three or four stories they're all different stories okay in citizen can there's no contradiction of anything okay citizen can make sure that there's no contradiction they're giving different views and different perspectives on the same number of same events but there is no no thing in the sense that any single event is contested right in rashomon they are contested the events are contested that's the basic thing to rashomon and i don't i'm not a great admirer of rashomon because basically what all it's saying is that the number that the, each person tells the story to suit his own purpose to make himself look good is what the thing is saying it's not any any kind of treaties on uh, objective reality and that sort of thing it's just a very basic thing of people telling lies that's all it's about right this is not like rashomon okay this is fundamentally where you have different stories so each one looks at a different aspect of it but the important thing is each story functions autonomously like a, a thing like a a climax and a resolution right okay everything starts with a climax has a has a climax and a resolution let's look at this i mean what is uh, which are the various uh, relationships there one is between uh, kane 
and uh, uh, Leland, okay, Jed Leland, right? Jed Leland and uh, one of the relationships, friendship, right? The relationship between the friends. What is the what is the climax of the thing after which the relationship collapses? What is the climax there? Uh, it's because of Susan. Susan, right? When he writes a review of Susan's uh, performance, yeah. Yeah. okay, yeah. he publishes the performance simply because of his ego, okay, and then he uh, dismisses him, right? What is the relationship between Susan and him? It's the same thing, but told from a different angle. Okay, Susan doesn't like the fact that he has uh, given him a given him a uh, after uh, sacking him, but given him a present of some sort, or given him money or some such thing. Though actually, it is no so the Susan is angry with that. But Susan thing is somewhere else, and it goes along that he gives up the thing and they retreat into the sun or Xana do that loneliness and all that. So that is a different thing, right? And when Sue, a climax of there is Susan saying him, you you don't love me, you only want to be loved. You have always bought things. That kind of thing is a, is a Susan thing. This one, which one? Uh, so the point I'm trying to make is, you look at these stories. Each one has a separate climax and a separate a separate resolution. Okay, separate resolution. So finally, all this comes together, right? Okay, all of this comes together. It's like a sine wave, you know, a sine one goes like this, the next one goes like that, okay? Because these waves are all together, okay? Because it's not one thing, but these number of separate stories, what they make is the center thing, the reality under, under, under underlying this whole uh, Kane's, uh, the uh, reality under, underlying, say, Kane's life is left mysterious in some sense, right? Okay? It is left mysterious. You don't really know what exactly Kane wants. Actually, by having that rosebud at the end, that there's an attempt at, uh, you know, at demystifying that. I, I don't think that's, a, I don't know what else he could have done. But to have another view to say rosebud, whose view is that? That fact that, that this rosebud is shown, the that's a sledge is shown there and it's, the uh, snow is melting on it, the paint is cracking. Whose view is that? Till then, everything is somebody's view or the other. But when finally the camera focuses on that, I'm not very sure that it's a thing. But what could you have done? You have to, you know, suggest some kind of, you know, central reality of some sort, right? It couldn't have been left. So I don't know exactly, but that's the way it works. There are, for example, this political life, right? This political life, what is the first thing that he's engaged to the daughter or the niece of a president, right? Okay. And then this Jim Gittes comes along and then he does this. When the Jim Gittes come, the climax is when he's exposed, his papers uh, loses the election, when that love nest is discovered and all that. That is the climax. That's a separate thing. Okay. So each is a separate. So the, what happens is not one uh, story with one climax, which is a normal linear uh, thing in Hollywood, but to have several stories all about the same reality. Okay. And then all of them together suggest or imply an underlying mysterious reality hidden from sight. So finally, what you get is a very complex view of a certain uh, thing. Okay, this is what you get. I don't know any other thing which where where it works. Uh, it, it works exceedingly well. Uh, the story itself, there isn't much. Uh, the, what the point I want to make is that by manipulating the plot in a certain way, by giving different uh, things in a different uh, versions of a single story, this film has enriched itself considerably, where the story itself would not. If the story of Citizen Kane had been told in one linear form from the, shall we say, from the, it would have been a very ordinary film. It not, may not even have made it, a, got a, an Oscar or anything, okay? So, okay. Now, well, let's go to the next film. Now, let's look at Vertigo. Now, Vertigo is one of my favorites. Uh, it's now rated to be the greatest film of all times. It was earlier Citizen Kane was, but now Vertigo is. Now, what ex exactly uh, Vertigo? Let's look at Vertigo. All of you have seen Vertigo. I mean, it's a, it's a film which, uh, which everybody, I mean, would know the film, right? There are actually two plots in the film, right? The first plot is the unearthing of Madeline's past, right? Madeline uh, Elster, I think, yeah, Gavin Elster's wife, Madeline. There's an elaborate, what happens in that plot is, okay, uh, Scotty, you know the story, I don't have to tell you the story, right? Scotty has uh, got vertigo, he's employed by his old uh, school friend to follow his wife to figure out what's happening to her. And he goes along and he finds she that the, the, the elaborate buildup of Madeline. I won't tell you the story. The important thing is that Madeline, as presented, as discovered by Scotty in the first half of the movie, 
okay, is the unearth, unearthing of Madeline, exactly what she is, that she's actually the great granddaughter of somebody called Carlotta Valdez in old San Francisco. Carlotta came from the south from somewhere, Mexican, uh, Spanish Mexican woman, who was generally became the, uh, the mistress of some uh, big businessman there, that household where she was kept. And she had a child, the child was taken away or some such thing. She went mad. Okay. And the point is, nobody knows about it, but somehow her spirit is, uh, is inhabiting Madeline. This is a story made up. But gradually what, what the story is doing is, what the film is doing in the first part is, this whole story, as you know, is fake. Okay. There is no Madeline. Or rather, he is, Scotty has never seen Madeline at all. What she was like. Okay. He has never seen Madeline. The woman he sees is this woman actress or Judy playing the part of Madeline. She's in disguise. Okay. This Judy is taken and then put in disguise. And the whole story of Carlotta Valdez, okay, brought in there. That's a true story. The important thing here is the story of Carlotta Valdez is very true. There has been a Carlotta. You see the grave. There is a portrait of Carlotta, which is that it's like this, you know, it's like this. Okay. You want to build a picture about me, right? Okay, I am I'm a nobody. I'm just a film critic, right? You take my picture, you tell somebody, you know who this guy is. This guy is the biggest gangster. Anybody is responsible for the death of so many people. And you show this picture, you show that picture, you show proofs of, of various things, right? You show proofs and you build an elaborate story about me, okay? So finally, that person is, is, is imbibed this whole story, internalized this whole story that I have become something. In this particular case... Scotty develops this fascination or this, what is, what is this thing, this, this passion or whatever, this uh, obsession for this Madeline who doesn't exist at all. Okay. The point is, what does he put into the story of Madeline? What has, has been put into the story of Madeline? Okay. She has been not only, not only appearance, not only accent, not only what she looks like, her money, her all this kind of stuff. Her, not only her family, he's been given an elaborate family history. Okay. And that family history is not only of her family. It includes the history of, uh, of uh, San Francisco. It talks about San Francisco of the old days. There is that hotel where she comes and spends some time, right? There is some, some, some indication that it's some supernatural element there. The, the person at the counter doesn't see Madeline, right? But she has and, uh, gone and sat there. Scotty has followed her there. So this entire thing of, you know, San Francisco, the past of San Francisco, what happened, what are the various things are built into the thing. Is that all? Is there something else? You remember that scene? You remember that scene where they go to the Sequoia National Park? Okay, you go to that scene. Sequoia National Park, he goes in there and then he's looking at the tree, the cross-section yeah, of the yeah. tree which has been yeah, cut yeah. down yeah. and he looks at that cross-section of the tree and there that cross-section shows that the tree is a thousand years old. 1066, Magna Carta, the whole history of the world is on that tree. Right? Thousand, thousand two hundred years. Okay. At that point, what Madeline does is she puts her hand here and finger here and says, I, I was born here, I died here, you took no notice of me. It is as if what he has done is he has this fictional character has been placed in the history of the world in some way. Okay. If, she, if her history is fake. Okay. Now I would like to ask a question. If her history is fake. Okay. If, if her family's past is fake. What do you think about the history of the world? Is it true? There's something here, you know, there is something here. Okay. I, I would recommend all of you can write it down. I would recommend this uh, story of you. All of you can go and read the story. It will be available on the, on the, on the internet. Uh, Jorge Louis Borges, J-O-R-G-E-L-U-I-S, B-O-R-G-E-S. Okay. B-O-R-G-E-S. You look for this story called the, the, called the theme of the traitor and the hero. Okay. Have a look at the story. It's only four pages long. It's four pages long. It's diabolical. Okay. It's a story entirely about, about the construction of history in some way. You have a look at it exactly about what exactly is a fiction in history. What is it's, it's a extreme. I won't tell you anything more about it. I can't go into that story. Have a look at it. The whole point is this Madeline is a kind of fiction who has been incorporated into the history of the world through that one scene. You get me? Which means that she's actually her life, you know, 
her life mandalin talking about carlotta valdez and talking about her connection is made through this one uh, cross section of the tree okay so the question is then in order to make madeline more intense what hitchcock does is the ordinary midge okay midge tries to dress up like madeline you remember midge the very ordinary looking extremely unromantic extremely you know she is made to dress up like that to as a, as a kind of as a token of that fakery okay that you are trying to look holding that flower or sitting there okay and the point is he gets wild scotty gets wild because he is internalized that whole story of uh, you know so story of um, of uh, madeline and galato valdez so much and she so in love with this completely fictional woman right that that this midge is uh, you know he, he is extremely angry with midge this is the first story. at the end of it at the end of it what uh, what is the end, end end of this story is the point where madeline dies right okay madeline falls off the thing and she dies this is the way's end okay look at plot 2 the plot too is just the shall we say revelation of this whole story as a fakery okay scotty finds judy who, who resembles madeline but he does not find her attractive in the smallest sense right scotty does not love judy but Ju, but, but judy is in love with him now right judy is in love with him but scotty feels nothing towards judy he's trying to elaborately go on making up judy in the form of uh, to make her look like madeline so he can fall in love with her so he can love her so he'll have this woman he loves but the point is judy will not submit to that in the sense that she cannot be madeline makes her look like this gives her a wig gives her this gives her that gives her everything okay the point is that judy cannot admit this she cannot admit the fact that she has been because she's been complicit in the murder of madeline okay okay she cannot admit that she has actually killed this uh, woman that this i mean she has killed a certain woman responsible for it's not madeline the original madeline but uh, the, but scotty doesn't know about it so the entire second part you could say is a kind of debunking of the first part in some way but also there's another important part that scotty's own character character cuts come coming into the coming into focus by now scotty has lost his love for that madeline gradually little by little he has come to the conclusion that it was a fakery okay but now he is only interested in losing that uh, vertigo of his and he starts ill treating judy you remember that he starts one by little by little by little he starts uh, thing okay so finally finally he virtually drives her to her death you can almost say he drives her to her death and she has collaborated so the in that murder therefore there is attribution here but the point is scotty is a very selfish streak he is not the kind of good guy that we took him for he's got a selfish streak he's doing things he should be doing he's treating uh, judy who's basically innocent in the whole story madeline doesn't exist uh, scotty is selfish judy who's actually harmless who's actually helpless Who's made into this? The real villain who's given Ulster, Ulster just gets away. No mention of him at all. He says, "I'm going far away. I want to forget all this," and he just runs away. No, no news of him at all. Okay. Now let us look at the 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 scene in the movie, which is that that climactic scene when she says, "It's too late. It's too late. It's too late." You remember that thing when she starts climbing up? What does she see in that scene? What does "too late, too late" mean? Have you seen the movie properly? Yes, yes we take that to mean that destiny is catching up with her right at that particular moment but there's a car coming there okay if you look at that watch that film carefully there's a car moving there what she has seen is the car that gave in alster brelster bringing the real madeline there okay in order to kill her and uh, what's her name did all of you notice this i just want to answer please no no response at all from you guys He said, "Did you notice that thing, the car, which is coming in at that particular moment?" He sees is the car. Okay, you look at it again. You look look at that scene. So what, what Madeline is saying, or rather, what Judy as Madeline is saying in that particular thing, it's too late. Is he's already killed the woman? Okay, she's already killed the woman. He's come to throw the body from there. That's what she's meaning. But we take that to mean some metaphysical thing. We take that to mean it's too late. Means destiny is there. I am going towards. I am going towards my death. It's too late. It's too late. Okay. When we see that movie again a second time, I realize this is there. That thing actually it cements the you know 
the first plot against the second plot. You get me? This is the way the film works. And it works like this, this entire thing, you know. And may please read that story. I don't know this. I saw this uh, theme of the traitor and the hero. It's just a four-page story. You just have a look at it. It's like it's a masterpiece. It was made into a film by Bertolucci, a bad film called The Spider Stratagem. I don't know if any of you have seen that. I don't even know if you've heard of it. It's not, not a good film at all. It was made badly by Bertolucci, who is not a great filmmaker. But um, it was made made by him. But this uh, this uh, short story is a masterpiece, uh, absolute masterpiece. You have a look at what this uh, thing of construction of history, reconstruction, fiction as history, and all that is explored in that uh, particular uh, four page story. Okay, I would uh, ask you to read it. It make you may give you some insights in what I, what I mean by this thing of uh, vertigo. Any questions about vertigo, please? Anybody at anybody at all? Okay. Just one. Yeah. We have a question. The name of the story is the theme of the traitor and the hero. Hero, okay. By B O R G E S. It's there and online. You will find it uh, online. Okay. Just read. It's a four-page, four-page story. Very short story. The theme of the traitor and the hero. Okay. By your J O R G E B L U I S B O R G E S. Just read this. And see if uh, vertigo, vertigo connects in some way with that story. I'm not sure it does, but I thought it meant. Thema, right, absolutely correct. Yeah, theme of the traitor and the hero, okay? By Borges, okay, all right. So any other, uh, any questions up to here? So you just to the next one, one question, sir. Please, I've just please. been wondering, like, you know, vertigo is, is a mental condition. Yeah. How, how, how important was it to the story? What happens if it was not there? It's very important because it is that fact that this chap is afraid of heights, which gives, uh, which gives uh, what's his name, uh, Gavin Elster, a handle with which to. So he knows very well if he takes her on top of the thing, this man can't follow him, right? It is that that is the thing which which uh, give when he hears about this story that he's got vertigo, he couldn't do. It. That is the thing. Yeah, he follows. See, no, no other guy. Sorry, sorry. After story came out of the hospital, he follows Judy. No other main character has seen them together. Yeah, he has not seen them. So what do you make of that? What do you make of that thing? Yeah. Of course, Judy, of course, the thing is that Judy doesn't look like uh, Madeline at all now. In fact, I don't know. She looks completely different. The point is that we were, it's difficult to say that the same actress, everything about her is different. I think if somebody saw Judy with the, you know, with the, with the, I don't think she can be mistaken for Madeline by anybody because everything about her is different, right? She's coarse, she's not uh, she's beautiful, her hair is different, everything is right. Can we go to the next slide? Let's look at Pulp Fiction now. Pulp Fiction, four stories are intertwined. One is a diner, with uh, the characters are a Pumpkin, Honey Bunny and Jules, right? Jules and Vincent, right? This is the first story. The second is the Bonnie situation with Vincent, Jules, Mr. Wolf, Jimmy, Brett, and Marvin. Then you have the gold watch with Butch, Marcellus, Wallace, uh, Captain uh, Coons, and Fabian, right? That's the gold watch. Then you have Mia, Wallace, and Vincent Vega, right? Vincent, Mia, and then the drug peddlers. This, this, these are the four stories. Okay, the question, okay. How does this work, right? Now, the important thing is, entwine the story. He, he, he sort of ties up these stories in various ways. He plots them in such a way that you can't, he confuses the chronology, what happens, what happens before and what happens afterwards, right? Okay. Normally, when a story ends happily, it is a last event, you get me, right? The conclusion of a story is the last event, okay? In this particular film, what is the last event in the film? It's Honey Bunny and... Uh, uh, this happened, Honey, they've gone away, and yeah. Jules and Vincent leave the thing, right? leave the diner, right? Okay. Now, it's very important. This diner thing scene is very important. I think it's brilliant the way he has done it. Opening shot, right? You have the you have the diner. You know, you know, you know, you're a film student, you know. How do you establish totality of space? Okay. You show the immediate thing. You, you close up on something. And then later on, you gradually expand it and show how it is located in the overall thing, right? So he split up this whole diner scene into one, which is the first scene where only the table of these two guys and they uh, hands up and then uh, stick them up, all of you, give me your money or something, or I'll have to shoot or something. He says that, right? He doesn't show the rest of the diner there, right? So when the rest of the diner is shown, he shows only coffee, okay, this sort of thing. So the question is that thing of totality of the space is not shown now. 
the totality of space is shown at the framing sequence at the end of it. So what he has done in effect is he has split up this thing, the space into two, one this table and the rest of the rest of the diner, right? So the question is the rest through the sound, through the thing of sound, he established that this is the same diner. So finally, when these two people are sitting there, when he says coffee, that's a brilliant way, I think an absolutely brilliant way of linking up the opening sequence with the closing sequence as part of the same space, right? So the diner is on like two ends of, a, of a bookends in a, holding books together, right? That is the way it works. Now, let us look at this uh, entire thing of Vincent and Jules walking out of this thing. The ending is positive because J Jules has given up his life of crime. Vincent goes away. He goes away. The, the two are uh, leaving together. So the entire thing of some people, some kind of thing of moral thing that you've chosen the correct path. But at that particular point, Vincent and Vincent who's going out with Jules, good friends, Vincent is already dead. Okay. He's already dead according to the story, right? So the question is that he has done this when he, I mean, uh, yeah, Vincent is already dead. And Vincent, in my view, is the sweetest guy in the story. He doesn't want to kill. Okay. He wants to have a good time. Okay. He's basically, he happens to be in the wrong profession. He doesn't have, he's a forgiving kind of person who really has no, uh, no quarrels with anybody. He's that, that sort of guy, right? He does participate in the killing in the very first uh, thing in the with Brett and all those guys. He participates in the killing, but he's a decent guy. Who is the dirtiest character in the sense without loyalty, without this, without anything? It's Butch, right? Okay, I think, uh, uh, what's his name? Bruce Willis in the best role of his career. I think this movie, I think, I think Tarantino never came close to doing something like this again in his life. He won't also. The point is that the, the, the kind, of, uh, kind of characterization which is in this film, Travolta, brilliant. This fellow, what's his name? Samuel Jackson, Master, Master, Master Lee, this guy. The point is Samuel Jackson's subsequent line. You know, I don't know. This is, a, shall we say, extraneous. American movies, when they have black characters or frightening black uh, African-American characters, Okay, always follow it subsequently with films in which this frightening character is kind of pacified in some way and made a nice fellow. They did that with the uh, Morgan Freeman. I don't know if you've seen this Morgan Freeman movie called Street Smart. Have you seen it? I suggest you try it out. He's frightening, actually, Morgan Freeman in Street Smart. Sidney Poitier was a frightening character in a film called The Blackboard Jungle. Quite frightening, okay. But the point is, subsequently, something happens. They're all made very nice, nice guys. Samuel Jackson subsequently became a nice guy. Movie after movie after movie started playing. But here he is quite terrifying, right? The point is, Butch is a bloody crook. Okay. He has no, but the point is he's bold. He's a rash character. And uh, so the question is, the film ends with the crooked character getting away. Okay. Getting away because of some luck or whatever. He gets away. After the death of the nicest guy in the film, this is the way it ends. Okay. Whereas if you look at it the other way, if you, if you look at it in terms of plot, it ends in a completely different way. What the film seems to be doing, what the film seems to be doing, okay, okay, that having, having different, firstly, having different characters participating in small stories and large stories, you get a, I mean, different perspectives on the same character. Uh, Vincent Vega, who is a minor character in one, he becomes a big character. Actually, one of the reasons Vincent Vega is such a sweet character is that Mia Wallace story. Okay, it's because that Mia Wallace story and his thing that the kind of conversation he makes and all that, which is not the kind of conversation that Butch makes or the conversation that, uh, you know, what's the other guy, Jules makes. Okay, or the kind of thing that Marcellus Wallace, he's actually a romantic, he tries to make some sense. He tries to talk in some way. So that makes him a somewhat a very nice character. So he's given a position in another movie when he's done to death completely heartlessly. And that too, what is that? He's coming into WC. He's just, you know, use the WC and he's coming out of there, but uh, putting on, pulling up his trousers and he's killed by this guy, right? I mean, this sort of completely cold-blooded uh, murder of this chap. Okay. And that too, in such a casual way. Okay. And that guy's a triumphant look after killing him. I mean, just look at that. On one side, you've got this very sweet guy, in this romantic thing with the drugs and all that, but it's a very romantic scene. And there, the other thing is that uh, horrible scene, right? Where he's uh, done to death, right? So then, so the question is, the question is entirely, it's a very pessimistic story and at heart about gangsters, but entirely through 
you know, through this business of, of editing, through the business of plotting, this very pessimistic story is given, made optimistic. A man searching for the true way, like a biblical thing, understanding this, understanding this. So basically, he's saying that, basically, he's trying to make out that this, uh, this whole business of optimism and pessimism is a more a question of, it's a question of how you plot things, how, how, how you make stories. You're actually constructing stories. Okay. It's out of the stories you construct, not out of reality, but out of the stories you construct. Okay. This is basically the thing of, uh, the thing of, uh, of uh, Pulp Fiction. I, I would say it's a great film and great American movies. Any questions up to here? Anybody has any question? What was the kind of intention? See this, and this is exactly, see the question is, it is about narration. You understand? Okay. He's not dealing with so much. I, I, we will the next film also. I, after the next, uh, I discuss the next film is over. I'll tell you, it is not about reality, but rather our construction of reality. You get my point, right? In fact, this is the same thing. In fact, all four stories, in my opinion, all four of the things are not films about reality as a normal film would be, but by having this great distinction between plot and story. You're basically not talking about reality, but about our construction of reality. Okay. Now, in Indian cinema, this distinction is not that. Have you? Can you think of any Indian movie where this plot and story are so far apart? I don't. Know, as far as I can make out, there isn't any. It's plotting is not important in Indian stories. In fact, the, yeah, no smoking. Yeah, no smoking is a weird film. I really don't know what to make of that movie. I couldn't understand it, so I can't talk to you about. It. I saw it, but I couldn't make much out of it. That's that's the thing people will bring. I couldn't make out much of that film, right? Okay, I don't know. I haven't seen this, but the point is, this entire thing of plotting, okay, is uh, is uh, you know this plotting. The the point about plotting is plotting is the way in which we bring meaning to reality, right? The point is, on narration is a way in which we bring real reality itself has no meaning, right? It has no meaning of its own. But in the process of telling stories, we will uh, we come to, to deal with reality where we try to make some sense out of reality. Okay, let's go. We'll, I will discuss so this what, again. What about Amit Dutta's film, sir? I mean, I've seen something on some uh, Nain Sukh. Nain he's, Sukh. Not a, he's, he's a documentary filmmaker, right? He's a, he's a, he doesn't do any fiction films at all. He's documentary, isn't he? Nain Sukh, I mean, I've seen. I've seen something else also. Yeah. Uh, some other one I've seen. I forget one. But he's a documentary yeah. filmmaker. He doesn't much. I don't think he has much to do with plotting. He doesn't have to. See one, see, one of the things before you mention Indian movies, okay. Think in terms of the rigor of the plotting, right? Citizen Kane is extremely rigorous. I don't find, see, for example, no smoking is extremely vague. Okay. I, it doesn't stick in my head what exactly the plotting is. I don't know what to make of it. It's the same. So it's a, this, this question of rigor in the plotting is very important. We must know, the, we must know the, the, the relationship between what is the underlying reality, what is the story and the way in which reality is reconstructed by the plot. You get me? Okay. It's not simply a matter of putting this together, that together. That, it's not that sort of thing. There has to be rigor in this. I'm not, I'm, for example, I didn't bring that. What is that one? Uh, what is that one where everything happens backwards or in that other one, with the French one? I didn't bring that at all. Which one, sir? Memento, Memento. And there was one more film of this guy. Who's the chap with the... Uh, extremities, that film Extremities, it's called, I didn't bring that at all. What is the name of that guy? Irreversible. See, I didn't bring reverse, Irreversible. So as far as I, I can make out, Irreversible has nothing to say very much. Uh, Gaspar, no, correct, right? I, it has nothing very much to say, just a trick, clever way of uh, uh, piecing it together. Whereas these films actually have something to say, okay? These films actually have something to say about what, what is reality, what is underlying reality, how do we construct stories in order to make something of underlying reality. Okay, now let's go to the last one and then we'll discuss it, right? Celine and Julia. Celine and Julia go boating. Now, at first glance, what is the film about? Okay, it looks linear. Two girls, one of them is a magician, amateur magician. The other is a librarian. Okay, they run into each other, uh, other in uh, on the street or somewhere. They become friendly, and one tells the other that she has joined the household as a nanny to a little girl. Right? The point is, she doesn't remember what happened in the story when she goes there as a nanny. Because what happens in the house? She joined the household. What has happened in the household when she's a nanny? But every time she comes out to the suite, right? 
she eats the sweet when she eats the sweet gradually what happened in the story comes to her right you get me okay you're following this this is the way what happens right yes. so what happens is then gradually every time she goes and comes out gradually goes in and comes out certain events keep happening again and again certain events are uh, fresh every time so gradually it looks like it's a cyclical narrative something happening okay the same words are said looks like theater because the acting acting is very different in that interior that's that story within the that uh, house what is happening in this in the house the story is very different the acting is very different do you agree with me or don't please if you can't uh, i mean if you don't agree with me don't yes. uh, please don't stop uh, hesitate the acting is very different kind here the acting is improvised it's spontaneous they do whatever they want okay there the acting is very fixed there's a rigid it's like theater acting okay so the question is then you gradually enter and you find that what is happening inside this uh, this store the house okay is cyclical events the same events keep repeating and a gradually story is being enacted then you realize that this whole film is actually a metaphor for us reading a story okay when you get into the story the story is fixed now i am i am sitting here i am talking to you, i can do anything i can take this cup i can put this cup up here i can put it down i can do anything okay but if i am get into a particular story i am reading a particular story what happens is that story is fixed in some way right so the people are fixed their destinies are fixed there is no way that a story a character in the story can alter his or her destiny right this is the basic thing so the question is what happens in this thing is they get into this fixed destiny situation and they gradually come out with what does the story are going on inside that house that house should be taken as a story which is already written and every time they enter it they enter into different parts of the story that is today i enter into chapter 5 tomorrow i enter into chapter 7 the day after into 11 tomorrow into day after tomorrow into 4 and then move into 5 so the question is gradually you read the different parts of the story and the story gradually emerges now what is the story for that story within the thing okay rivet took two stories of henry james i think one was called the other house and one was called the romance of certain old clothes he took these two stories and made them into one particular story and put it into that right are you getting me right this is what he did so the question is the story which is going on there is there are two men and one uh, one man and two women and one child okay the child his wife is dead before she died She, she uh, one of the women is her sister. Before she died, she died. She took a promise from him that he would not marry again. Now the point is, both these women who dislike each other want him to marry them. Okay, one of them has advantage over there, but they realize that as long as a little girl is alive, they are not going to be be able to marry this guy. Okay, so what they are doing is they are trying to poison that little girl in various ways, and they, this this is gradually discovered by the nanny that these two women. or one of them or whatever is trying to poison this girl so the basic thing is that child should not be killed the child should be saved so what they do since one of them is a magician is they concoct some scheme no wait a minute see what the reason that the, the woman when she goes into the story the nanny is doesn't remember when she comes out is okay when she comes out is that she is actually a character in that story there is a place for a nanny a place for only one nanny so so through magic when they enter that story two nannies are there okay that other nanny the second nanny there's no place in the story so she will not be recognized by the other people she will not be recognized since her place is illegitimate she is not part of the story at all she can do whatever she wants the one nanny cannot bring the child out because she doesn't have freedom she is part of the story okay so these two somehow do it they use magic and this and bring the little girl out into the out of, out of the story into the real life okay when to bring her into real life when they bring her into real life what happens the, 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 the child in the cyclical story is murdered and murdered and murdered and murdered again okay but the point is that she cannot be murdered she has to be saved so they bring her out of the story and the final thing is she's been extricated from the story and then they go to the park next morning where there's a water body and they get into the thing to row and they find the man and the two women are there what does that mean it means okay what does it mean it means what i take it to mean is that rather than extricate the girls from the story they have become part of the story right now let us understand what this means right what is what does this mean okay 
I take this uh, movie to be about the relationship between the reader of a novel or the, or the spectator of a film. And, you know, when, you, when you're watching a movie, you're not getting the story of the movie, right? You're getting uh, stimuli, right? You get acting, you get the scenery, you get this, you get that. And gradually the story is constructed in your head. The story, film will not give you the story, okay? You're getting all the stimulus from there and you're constructing the story is actually in your head. That process is called narrativity, this entire business of constructing a story in your head. You will see this happening. This man will go from here to there. You will see all these devices like, uh, you know, construction of space, construction of time, construction of character, all this you will see. You will look at continuity, you will look at all that. And based on all this, you will construct the story. So this uh, film is actually about our reading stories, our watching movies, as a result of which we construct stories, right? And what do you make of this entire thing of, uh, you know, uh, this business of, how can, it's about the contamination of reality by the stories we construct. You understand what I mean by this? Okay. What do I mean by this contamination of reality by the story we construct, uh, construct around it? What do we mean by that? See, if you want to give an example, right? Let us take, for example, uh, the there's another film of Rivach, which, which I would want you to, which is an even more difficult film than this. His very first film called um, Paris Belongs to Us. It's a very difficult film and uh, prob probably more difficult than this. Uh, this, this some makes up that one is very difficult. But if you can, you watch it. I would. I wouldn't. I've written about it. It's on the on the website. Uh, it's called uh, jackrivet.com. It's there. My world is text or something. It's a essay I've written about dealing with four of his movies. The important thing is, look, when you talk about narrat narrative or constructing narratives about the world, okay. What we mean is, for example, you take um, the Christian thing of uh, Judaic thing of uh, of um, divine creation of the world, right? That is one narrative, you get me? It's a narrative. The other narrative would be Darwinian evolution. Okay. The question is, one will be more plausible than the other. But the point is that you go on believing in narratives. What happens? You begin, begin to treat your own narrative which you have constructed. Okay. As reality itself. Let us take, for example, the, the political scenario today, right? By and large, there are two views on political scenario. One is the right-wing scenario. One is the liberal scenario. But both are constructions of some sort. The reality is something else. But what happens is that when you start, I mean, there are plausible. It's not at all stories are equally plausible. Some are more plausible, more likely will stand up to evidence. Others will not stand up to evidence. So the question is there. Okay, But the point is that this whole business that we start constructing narratives about the world, like Darwin constructed about the thing, you start, you don't know, no, no longer look upon evolution as this narrative. Okay. You begin to look upon uh, evolution as fact. Okay. What you have is evidence. What you have is this. So you gradually go on. So the question is, you fine tune that. So basically, the point is, as you go on, you know, constructing narratives about the world and you get involved in narratives, the narratives take over the world. And finally, what you are left with is a narrative and you start believing in that. You begin trapped in that narrative itself. Okay. This is what happens in political narratives, that sort. Okay. This is this is basically my understanding of Celine and Julia. As I said, it's a, it's a complicated thing. Okay. So this is the thing. So after that, this, I will stop this uh, thing. Please, I, 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 all, all four films are not that easy. They're slightly more difficult. I would like you to please ask me questions. If you don't ask me questions, I can. Uh, it could mean that you haven't understood anything, or that you understood everything. It could mean either. Okay. So please ask me whatever questions. Any questions at all? Usually, at least two or three questions. Did you find these movies difficult? I mean, uh, three of them. Did you find this session more difficult than the others? It was slightly on a higher level, I think, sir. Compared okay. to Mizo Gucci, I think that was like yeah. They see Mizo Gucci and all that. See, the thing about Mizoguchi, Bresson, all this, you're basically dealing directly with reality, right? This is a somewhat philosophical thing in that sense that you're dealing with what is reality. You're dealing with something else slightly different. What is reality? For example, okay, ghost stories, I don't know. Okay, what is reality? What exactly is reality? What is the narrative we construct around it? So the question is, see, all four, all four uh, films in the thing uh, bring out this difference between a narrative construction and the underlying reality, right? You get me. The point is, there all of them are the, by by, by making, making this difference between plot and the story. They are basically making a distinct distinction between the world as it is. So there's no way of saying what the world as it is, right? The world as it is, reality, un, unmediated by any human thought, and what 
human beings would do to make sense of that reality you get me so all so the question is it's questioning all folk who have films question the underlying notion that there's a there's a stable reality there's a stable thing under uh, i mean uh, to which we all uh, you know are subject to that they question that stable reality they realize that a lot of the world as we as we see it okay is largely our own constructions of the world they're not really the world exactly as an 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 received unfiltered uh, unfiltered but basically constructed by ourselves okay as a as a way of making sense of the world this is what all four would do in different ways has this session made any sense i don't know because i'm not getting any questions at all it was wonderful sir Oh, that easily said. All of every there's no session of mine which is not wonderful, as according to you. But the point is, I know it's a difficult thing. But the point is, I want you to sort of think about this. I would uh, ask you to, uh, okay, in case you want, don't want to read that story, I'll tell you. This is very interesting. That I'll tell you the story of Tim and the Traitor and the Hero, rather than expect you to go go and read it. It's about this guy who's writing a biography of his grandfather. okay now the story is written as a story being written you get me okay i have thought of a story which happens in a place where there is a revolution it could be any place let us say it is ireland he says right he finds in the story he finds that his grandfather was assassinated on the eve of a certain uh, revolution a certain a certain rebellion against the british right now the point is he says he says uh, that it had the, he was killed assassinated in a in a in a theater by some assassin it somewhat seemed to resemble uh, abraham lincoln's assassination okay it seemed to this uh, this grandson is saying he goes there and invest, starts investigating the grandfather's murder and he finds that two weeks before he was murdered on a very auspicious day on a very celebratory day of the some particular festival irish festival right two weeks before that they discovered that there was a traitor in their midst the the grandfather was the chairman or the president of those proceedings of that secret inner committee they did not mention who the traitor was but he was sentenced to death right now the various people in the grandfather's coterie for close friends circle of friends also in the sound the also in the uh, what do you say in that uh, central committee was one friend of his who was a poet he had translated shakespeare into gaelic which is the language spoken there right he has translated shakespeare into gaelic so what they the thing is this may the investigates and he finds that this traitor was there in their midst who sentenced to death and the point is why had the grandfather sentenced him to death what was the reason the grandfather is not really a bloodthirsty person he might have let him off or some such thing then and then he finds there are certain thing element, uh, events which have happened in the town after this uh, thing after this uh, meeting took place which resembles scenes from shakespeare somebody has a dream about something which resembled in julius caesar another one some scene from macbeth seems to have happened there in the town so why is it he wonders you know that all these things are happening shakespearean things have events are happening does it mean that life is imitating art does it mean that uh, you know that history repeats itself what exactly does it mean okay he's not able to understand finally the whole idea story comes to him okay this again i so the writer says i don't know how he finds this out this is something i still have to work out he says so because the story being written you see okay the inside story arrives at what is the inside story the inside story is that the traitor is the grandfather okay so the grandfather sentences himself to death with all these other people but the grandfather makes one request that 15 days i want to die as a hero i don't want to die as a traitor okay you call me a hero execute me make it look like i've been assassinated okay so because of my assassination let there be a rebellion as a, as a result of which my memory is carried forward as a hero and not as a villain right he asked this question so 14 days the scenario has to be written how to make the grandfather look great how to have this thing there is not enough time 14 days so this poet this irish poet is given the task of constructing the whole uh, events in that town okay uh, so that the grandfather dies the uh, events of uh, the life of a, of a hero and not that of a traitor 
and then he writes out since there is so little time he plagiarizes from shakespeare okay he copies scenes from shakespeare and puts them into the tone and people act it out okay so finally when everything happens the father the grandfather is executed he, he dies is assassinated he utters a few words which has already been practiced and already uh, rehearsed and he dies a hero okay so the the here the grandson wonders whether to publish the revised biography of the grandfather or keep it exactly as it is and the final words is perhaps he decides to publish it exactly as it was as a, as a hero and he says perhaps that too was foreseen which means that history itself has incorporated all this nonsense which has been written in this thing so whole of history has been you know has been incorporated into this thing what this man wrote that the, that the, so the entire thing of history itself as doctored by you know by writing by constructing his text you understand the whole point okay that's what so i so thought you should read this rather than you go and read it you may or may not read it i thought i'd go tell you the story so it is this very diabolical story of the thing of history itself is a construction the story is a construction plotting is construction we have to construct history in order to make sense of the world unless we make sense of the world we are at a loss so basically all our things all our sciences everything we do as basically constructions that we have done and these four films by talking about plotting and story in a certain way are drawing attention to the fact of reality being actually not reality but constructed by us you get me this is basically it. it's a certain philosophical view point okay so any questions up to here i'll be glad to answer anybody at all yeah correct that's right you see the point is they don't actually follow the hero's view point they don't follow the hero hero's view point but it's taken for granted like for example the whole film will not be point of view okay there'll be certain point but the question is when the hero is given a certain position but the question is is very rare that in uh, that in american movies that the narrator is unreliable he's usually reliable narrator there is no unreliable narrator very rare in fact one of the great things about psycho is in fact this this mad uh, protagonist who cannot be believed whose viewpoint is suspect hardly ever happens in american movies which is why something like you know scorsese is uh, what is that uh, shutter island and all that doesn't work they cheat he cheats in shutter shutter island okay so same thing with six sense he cheats okay he cheat all these movies they cheat they try to give you this uh, thing of a of a viewpoint which is uh, which is itself suspect but in the process of doing that they tend to cheat this is my basic thing all right any other questions they usually don't give a they follow the protagonist the protagonist viewpoint is taken to be the viewpoint the only way there is never this this kind of questioning of conservative as a construction you get me yeah so that is why these four movies the greatness lies in the fact that this whole thing of you know reality versus perceived reality constructed reality all these things are you know they they complicate this entire issue of what is reality and what is constructed right that is why i try to make these films okay on the same platform what is this rear window protagonist and audience was at the same platform but their rear window also is uh, you know it's not construction plot like that he constructs it vertigo is a more compl complex film than rear window rear window is again an entirely point of view right okay the, you're right i think what you mean is uh, that the the entire thing in rear window is point of view what anjan asked earlier yeah, rear, rear window we don't get to see the other side at all that's what you mean no correct you're right is completely one point of view rear window is completely one point of view it is always the james stewart point of view we never get to see the thing you know james stewart is actually constructing this story right of course at the end it turns out to be true little by little by little but it's again about construction you're right but it's not as complex a view of construction as vertigo is but it's also there that that basically what he is responding to are his own constructions based on the little bit he sees now the little bit he sees then sends in somebody to investigate and this and that and find out this and fire what your what your said is right basically it is uh, it is the fact that you do not see reality but you only see reality as seen by one person you are right rear window is a exception there otherwise uh, it follow it doesn't follow one protagonist in rear window it follows one protagonist it's completely one sided it's entire, entirely in one one person's view point you are right absolutely anything else i assume nothing more okay thank you thanks for the uh, number of people who are here i hope you enjoyed the session right so please two weeks from now i'll look at these four movies okay thank you thank you sir